Welcome, I'm John Caldera, president of the Independence Institute and your devil's advocate. I've been wanting to do this for a long time. I'm so thrilled he's in town. You're on Brooke, who runs the Ayn Rand Institute. And if you don't know who Ayn Rand was, let me do the, the quick thing, which would sure. be, she's an author. She wrote a few books that seem to have some lasting staying power. And would you, would you say she was one of the first who really put out a libertarian, free market philosophy in a way that people could digest through her stories? Would no question. I, I would even say she was the first to really, and maybe the only one, to really put together a comprehensive free market philosophy. There have been a lot of economists who presented the free market, proved that it worked, showed that it worked, why capitalism actually functions. But in terms of philosophy, in terms of uh, an epistemological, you know, uh, moral foundation for capitalism, who else is there? Let's talk about who hates Ayn Rand. All right. <laughs> so here's this little Russian immigrant who uh, got out of Russia in the 30s, was it? I'm trying to remember. 20s. She the got 20s. out of it. I mean, she, she, she was born in 05, so she witnessed the, the Russian revolution. revolution, lived under communism through her teenage years and in her early 20s, uh, made it here, kind of the last little window of opportunity to escape Russia, and she got out. She, if she would have stayed, she would have been killed. I mean, she was, she was a... Uh, resisting communism at every turn, and she was already on a blacklist. So she makes it here. And her name was Alice Rosenbaum. Rosenbaum. So she grew up as a middle-class Jewish family uh, in in the Soviet Union, and uh, made it here uh, with nothing. You know, and and if if there's ever been an American success story, this is it. She came here. She came to Hollywood. Her dream was to write and to write scripts. And she did. Now, yeah. this is, and I didn't know this until I started doing some research. Yeah. She worked for Cecil B. DeMille. She, she I mean, first day in Hollywood, she, she meets Cecil B. DeMille. She's, uh, she's at the studio. She's giving a letter of introduction, which she got from a relative in Chicago. And they say, you know, don't call us, we'll call you. Right. And she walks out the door, and there's this big limo sitting outside, and Cecil B. DeMille is in it. And he drives by, and he stops, and because and she's staring at him. And she's, what are you staring at? And she tells him, I'm here, I'm just here from Soviet Union. I love American movies. I love you, your movies. He says, get in. He takes it to the back lock of the king of kings of all movies, right? Which he lands up being an extra in. And this, this was a huge production. I mean, this huge. is a huge sound stage, of extras all over. He said, you want to Moses, meet, you uh, write commandments. for the movies, you got to see how movies are made. So here she is. A uh, young, young woman from the Soviet Union, and she's just immersed in this. And from there, she's an extra. She works in a wardrobe uh, department. She, she does any odds and ends job to get by and ultimately writes scripts, writes plays, and writes uh, some of the best, uh, most well-known American novels in history. Let's start with her name, because a lot of people mispronounce Ayn, and it's always yeah. Anne Rand, but yeah. that's all right. Yeah. Uh, I, I heard that Rand came from the Rand typewriter she used. Is that, is that no, fib or not, is that? Not true. Okay. It's, it's, it's completely falsified. So there's a lot of questions about where she came up with the name, but it turned out that she came up with Rand before there was a Rand typewriter. So uh, the name Man, is that's just there. how good she is, right? Yeah. All right, all right no. <laughs> so, I, you know, she came up with a different name because she wanted to be out. She knew she was going to write anti-communist content, and she wanted to protect her family. So uh, she chose a pen name that distanced herself from, from, uh, from the family from name. Mom. Right. I don't think it would have helped because the KGB is a little bit more sophisticated than that. They figured it out pretty quickly. Yeah. Uh, but, but, yeah, she wrote under the name Ayn Rand. Uh, and, uh, you know, when she married, uh, she used her legal name, which was her husband's family name, but as a, as a, as a writing name, it was Ayn Rand. Now, let, let me tell you my introduction, which, you know, I have always been, small l, libertarian, mm -hmm. that the idea that two people can have a relationship based on what is important to them, this consensual relationship, and that other people can use the coercive power of the state to, to stop them is what I think one of the most repugnant hate crimes there is. And, you know, as a young man, I, I didn't know how to express that really well, but there's something that this is wrong. When a collective of people use a power to say, you and you want to do something together that hurts no one, sure. but you both benefit from it in whatever ways you figure out. And it might be weird. I might not understand it. I might not like sure. it. You know, um, but to say, no, you can't do that. Uh, 
there was something that just ripped me inside uh, with anger of how dare you the, the beauty of free association among mm -hmm. men is 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 what life's about and so uh, when I found, I think, the first book I read of hers, because I'm dyslexic, I don't know how to read, all right? It's really <laughs> difficult. So I, I, looked, I looked at all the sizes, yeah, and there's yeah. Atlas Shrugged, and then there was uh, Fountainhead, Fountain all right? And then there was, uh, all right, Anthem, Anthem, Anthem. Can I can do this. This was this, <laughs> was this big. And, and I was like, finally, mm -hmm. somebody is talking about something that, that touched me. It's like, this is what I've been meaning to say, and it's in words. And, and then once that started, you know, I had to read the rest. And it wasn't for me that, you know, oh my God, I am convinced. For me, it was finally somebody has written out what what, what I, I believe, feel. what yes, I feel, what I, yeah. what I believe, and a lot of people I hear that that kind of response all the time. For me, it was it was very different. I grew up I grew up in Israel, and was raised in Israel, and and very collectivistic, very tribal. Mm -hmm. uh, culture, particularly back then, a lot, a lot less so today. Uh, you were, you were, you were raised to sacrifice for the tribe. The tribe was the right. primary. The collective was the, the group, the state, whatever. And and I had bought into that. And I, when I was 16, I was a, I was an altruist morally. I was a collectivist politically. I was a socialist politically. And uh, a friend of mine started. You know, we used to get together, talk about ideas, and he would sp start started these free market ideas, and I looked at him one day and I said, where is this you know, BS coming from? <laughs> and he said, you gotta read this book, and he, and he handed me Atlas Shrugged. You know? yeah. And it took me months to read, because I right. fought it. I said, this can't be true, and I'd throw it against the wall, and I'd argue against it, and I'd, I'd yell at Ayn Rand, she wasn't there, of course, but by the end of the book, she had won me over completely. I mean, I'm, I'm still right. Although, you know, the, the, ha the um, um, John Galt speech at the end could have cut it down just a little bit well, for those it, of us who don't have the attention. Again, thing. maybe, but, but for me, it was, it was like revelation, right? right? This was amazing. This was, here was a, a whole new philosophy, a whole new way of looking at the world that had never been exposed to, you know, laid out in front of me uh, comprehensively. Yeah, I wanted to get to the story, right. uh, but what let, an essay that is just as a standalone. Let me put out a couple thoughts on this and, and tell me if you think I'm, if I'm hitting it right. Unlike other books on economics or political philosophy or relationships, what Ayn Rand did for me is she put it in a story. Mm -hmm. And the story allowed me to get a hold of this and think about these things. Now, when I talk to people, they go, this is a ridiculous story. This is, you know, blah, blah, blah. and I go, <laughs> Do they I, watch the news? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but what, I, what I'll say is, you don't take it as, as a novel in itself. You take it as a description of a philosophy. And we illustrate the philosophy through this story. And that makes it accessible to guys like me. Now, Ayn Rand went on to do lots of philosophy, d philosophy yes. books. I can't read them. I, I couldn't get through one of them. Yeah, I know a lot of people can't. Yeah. Uh, I know a lot of people who can't read the fiction. Exactly, I've heard that too. I've heard that too. See, yeah, but but see, she wouldn't agree with what you just said because she, she had a purpose for writing fiction, and her dream since the age of nine was to write fiction. <clears throat> and to her, the key to the Fountainhead and Alice Shrugged and, and Anthem is the story, and it, the byproduct of the story for her is the philosophy. So it's not that she starts right. with the philosophy and says, "I want to illustrate in a story." To her, she starts with the story, and she said, to really tell the story well, it turned out I needed to develop a philosophy because I couldn't find. Really? And she actually writes this. She says her goal in writing was the projection of the ideal man. Right. Right. And she said, I read all these philosophers, and nobody could tell me what an ideal man was. Everything they were saying about man, I found repugnant. So I had to develop my own ethics, if you will, my own system of philosophy, my own epistemology to, to center, you know, a man around <clears throat> reason, for example, and, and around his own self-interest, you know, which is her philosophy, in order to be able to present it in fiction. And right. that's where you get Howard Rock, <clears throat> and that's how you get John Galt. Which are, which are, in my mind, mythical men, archetypal men. You know, I, I, I have a hard time saying, that guy over there, yeah, he's John Galt. It's, no, he has John Galt no, characteristics. It's the ideal. It's right, ideal it's we idea. strive towards. That's right. how she viewed it, the perfect man. And, and, and that's the, you know, the ideal that we try to model ourselves after. So I'm, I'm going to school up at the uh, University of Colorado in Boulder, you know, <laughs> and I'm walking through the student center, and there is a, a, 
student display, you know, you know how they have the little clubs or whatever, yeah, yeah. and it's all about ripping on Ayn Rand, who, yeah. you know, it's like, wow. You know, so I, was, I was like, wow. But, you know, the, the girl at the booth was really cute, so I was happy to, oh, I don't know. And, I'm with you. But, but there, was this, there was this violent, and I do mean oh, yeah. violent reaction to these books still today, some 50 years after oh, Atlas Shrugged. I'd say more today than ever. Right. I mean, it, not a week goes by where Salon.com doesn't write some scathing right. thing about Ayn Rand, or will write a regular article, but has to, in one paragraph or another, you know, take right. some jabs at Ayn Rand. Krugman, Paul Krugman, you know, yeah. our, our, our national economist, I guess, um, or pseudo-economist, uh, every quarter, right? right? On the dot, he has something that attacks Ayn Rand. Uh, Huffington Post monthly attacks Ayn Rand. It, it's, it's almost, it's almost it's like, unbelievable. It's almost like this derangement that um, that that this is this is a cult. That this is a, a woman who started something and poor saps are following mindless. There's some there's some irrational hatred of this. Let, let me give you one aspect of it. Yep. Now, I, I heard a sure. lot of this, which was from women. You know, here we are, a couple guys talking about about Ayn Rand. So yeah. let, me, let me ask you about this. Well. You know, the, the rape scene in, in, in uh, Fountainhead, you know, the way that men dominated women in this and that she had this, you know, that was a, a sexual thing for her, that's, that is just so wrong. It's anti-feminist. And, of course, during the 70s, it, this book that she wrote decades earlier comes into, into the center of, of a feminist storm. Sure. But this, but this is the, whole, the absurdity of what they're claiming, right? Who else in all of American literature, including today, has a woman, executive, running a railroad, more right. competent than any guy out there, who is, who is driving the men around her to succeed. She's clearly superior intellectually and as a business person, morally from everything, than her brother and, and then all the other guys out there. Right. Yes, Ayn Rand has a certain psychological view of sex. And maybe many women disagree, and maybe, maybe many men disagree. But that is a psychological view of sex, which, uh, you know, which I think needs to be taken seriously, because I don't think it could be completely dismissed. She was a smart lady. But if you look at the novels, if you look at the characters, if you look at Dominique in The Fountainhead, if you look at Dagny and Atlas Shrugged, these are women larger than life. Now, not only that, think of 1957 when Atlas Shrugged was, uh, was published, or 1945 when Fountainhead right. was published. These books have sex in them. Right. <laughs> there was no sex in 57, right? right. Nobody wrote about it. In, in movies and on television, married couples slept in separate beds, right? So she was way ahead of her time in terms of the whatever good there is in feminism, the idea of, of, of women being able to achieve, being able to be successful, no glass ceiling. Ayn Rand was way ahead of the feminist. She invented feminism from that perspective, right? As a, as a, as a collectivistic type, you know, women think differently than men nonsense. Yeah, she rejected all of that, and I'm happy that they reject Ayn Rand. But nobody presented stronger women. Nobody presented women who are more successful. Who, who, who at, at kind of guy stuff that Ayn Rand did. When Orson Welles made Citizen Kane, he had, was, was a remarkable thing because he had complete control. And ever since, the, when the, once that flopped, nobody ever got, <laughs> it became a collaborative effort, nobody could, could do it. And it was a flop. And then it started getting People on it. And, and, it, and discovered yeah. it. Yeah. And understood how, how he did things that were, that were amazing. Sure. You know, uh, Fountainhead didn't do well at first. And, and Atlas Shrugged really didn't do well at first, if I re recall. How many copies, let's go with Atlas Shrugged, how many copies have been sold about? Well, let's Shrugged? say both books did well. So what happened with The Fountainhead is The Fountainhead was rejected by 12 publishers. Nobody wanted to publish it. Finally, when it was put out, they only, they only printed, I think, 2,500 copies or something like that. Sold like that, word of mouth got around. It became a word of mouth bestseller. It was unbelievably successful very quickly. So by the time Atlas Shrugged came out, publishers were fighting to get to publish Atlas Shrugged. But that was, that was almost a decade later. Yeah, in right. 57, 12 years yeah. later. So uh, Atlas Shrugged was an instant bestseller. Atlas Shrugged, I mean, uh, has sold millions of copies. Fountainhead has sold millions of copies. Total for Ayn Rand is around 25 million copies of all of her books. Uh, the best number I know for Barack Obama, for the current president, I mean, I mean, this is his greatest achievement in my mind, is that since his election, 
Atlas Shrugged has sold over 2 million copies. And it, it spiked. Clearly, it right. spiked after let's, his election. Let's, let's bring it to today. Now, the names have changed, the, the, the names of the laws. There's not a dog-eat-dog -dog no. law. There's no. all these. But, but I look at how the regulatory state is keeping people apart. Last week, we had a show right here on two people who wanted to have uh, a bar where you go and smoke vaping. It's uh, steam cigarettes. Yeah. Uh, the landlord and the tenant, and they want to have this relationship, but the city council thought, that's perverse. Yeah. Uh, we don't yeah. know. And so you can't do this. The, the regulations that have come in, particularly in the last uh, six years, but even, you know, it, even but it's been that. growing. It's growing. Yep. It's growing. Yep. Yep. Sometimes I turn around and go, this, this is so close to that. Oh, yeah, no, this is yeah, what's going me, on in couple, America yeah. today. Well, give me whether, a couple it's, examples. whether it's Obamacare, mm. if you read the little, there's a little speech in Alice Shrugged by the doctor who goes on strike, not to give the whole plot away, but, and, and, and you read that, that little section, and he's like he's complaining about Obamacare, right? Um, the, the way, you know, people have made a link between the regulation of the railroads in Atlas right. Shrugged to net neutrality and, right. and the whole idea of the government wanting to come in and tell us what to, you do with you the know, Internet and right. what we do with our cable provider, what the cable provider does with the provider of content, what the provider, you know, all these relationships which are which the marketplace does beautifully and arranges beautifully and, and okay. it, it coordinates beautifully. And, and the government has to step in and, 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 and intervene So at every level. You know, Sarbanes-Oxley is probably a classic that could be taken out of the book. But this has been a hundred years in the making. Right. The, these regulations, but even, even down even down to a tiny area. I just heard today of um, a yoga studio school um, has decided to certify their instructors, yep. and so now the, uh, they complain for all their com competitors yep. who haven't been certified the way we're certified. Yep. Yep. You need to you need to put them out of business. And the state just sent out 88 letters to do this kind of stuff. In, in, uh, and to take these people who are just having relationships, consensual relationships, yep. and saying, you two people, you can't have the relationship. Right. So in California, you need a license to shampoo here. Right? And, and you see this across the board. You see it. You think and, and I care about that? But I know you, you don't. I don't care I about you that. Don't care I have no about sympathy it, about I, that. I care about it because it raises the cost of shampooing my hair. Um, a, one squeegee has lasted and, and, years. And the reason we both care about it, right. right, in spite of everything, is because who does this, who does this really hurt? It, hurt that, it hurts that ambitious poor person who's trying to make a living, who's trying to get up and, and, and out of welfare and trying to get a job and what the state is doing, really is oppressing them. It's keeping them out of the workforce and keeping them out of the ability to earn a living for well, themselves. Help, help, help me with this. Some people get it in certain areas. I see how much the gay movement has moved yep. in the last few decades. It's amazing. I, I, it's, a, it's amazing. Yep. And people go, they just want to have a relationship. Yep. The government should not stop them from yep. having a contractual relationship of their choosing. Yep. And then they turn around and support Obamacare, which forces people into relationships they don't want to have. And so I, I, I feel optimistic that if people understood the bigotry, and I'm talking from a purely sure. human area, I'm sure. not talking about it's good for poor people, it's good for the economy, yeah. it's good for, I'm not, no, no, all of which is true, yep. but the, the sin of stopping free association using between coercion, individuals. Using force to stop people from interacting voluntarily among each other. And the left gets it when it comes to, to, to gay issues uh, and, and maybe marijuana in, Cal in Colorado, in Colorado right. but it certainly doesn't get it when it comes to any economic issue. And, and here's where I think we have to go deeper. I think the opposition to, uh, let's call it economic freedom, uh, capitalism, is not about helping anybody. It's not about uh, economics. I, you know, I, I think we won the economic argument a long time ago. The free market guys that had all the good economists, we solved all the problems. We've made the argument. Although, it's done. Although, let's make, make this point. A lot of people believe that corporate welfare and cronyism is capitalism. Yeah. And, you know, that, it, that is but just they as... But didn't, they didn't 30 years ago. They right. didn't 40 years ago. This is a modern, more modern phenomenon. And yet we were because drifting away from capitalism. We've been drifting away from capitalism for but almost I just, 100 I just years. Make, make clear for cronyism for is, any, is as ugly as any other form absolutely. that stops but in my prison. view it's it's almost all the government's fault because right. if you give if you if, if i pointing a gun at you you're going to do stuff to defend yourself when government points a gun at business 
the, the business is going to try to get the gun pointed at somebody else. Although, They're going to try to. It's rare that business goes this, to though. the government and starts at it. But let me say this. When a business has uh, a foothold in, in whatever they're doing. They want to use the government to close down entry into that business. We see it with taxi cabs, we see it with all sorts of things. And that's, you know, sure, and that but, happens a lot. And, and but the when problem is goes, that when somebody has the power to do right. it. Exactly. The problem is that somebody has the power to do that. But my favorite fair example enough, of this enough. is Microsoft. Uh, pre, uh, and then we'll get back to the topic, yeah. but pre-19, pre-mid-90s, right. Microsoft spent exactly zero dollars on lobbying, had no presence in Washington, D.C., no offices in the area. And they were brought in front of Congress. And Senator Aaron Hatch, Republican from Utah, lamblasted them for not contributing and for not having an office in D.C. A year later, the just you can find this stuff on YouTube. A year later, the Justice Department goes after them. Right. So guess how much I spent today on what? They have, first of all, they have a beautiful Washington uh, office. Oh, of course. Not far from the Capitol. Glass, you know, walls, just gorgeous place. And then they spent tens of millions of dollars a year lobbying. Now, did the lobbying go from defending themselves to attacking their competitors? Sure. Once you get into that slippery slope, there's no any. But let's remember what starts this is the fact that the government has the power to coerce these businesses, to regulate them, to control them. And, and I'm, not, I'm not excusing many of these businesses. But if we're going to attack anybody, I think we need to attack it at the source, the source right. point. Well, it's, it's, it's a government but, that grants protectionism to, yes. to certain but industries. that's not, well, protectionism, and, 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 and it regulates well. it. It shouldn't regulate it. In my right. view, in Ayn Rand's view, we should have a separation of state from economics. The state should have no role in economics. They should have no role in voluntary transactions between two consenting adults. What, what is, we've only got a few minutes left, what is the role of government. There to, are externalities, and doesn't government have a role to make sure that people aren't dumping acid into our, our sure. so drinking the role, water? Sure, so the role of government, I don't like call it externalities, but the role of, of, of government is to protect us from criminals, terrorists, foreign invaders, and to arbitrate disputes, and that's it. So somebody pouring cyanide into the air or into my water is attacking me, physically attacking me. And, and, and there are plenty of laws on the books without the EPA that adjudicate that as, you know, in, in civil courts, uh, through legislation. You can't poison your neighbor. You can't pour your trash in your neighbor. So a lot of the externalities are problems of property rights. If we have property rights, we can solve the problems of externalities. Beyond that, the only role of government is to catch the crooks, catch the fraudsters. It's to, it's to uh, arbitrate disputes when we disagree honestly about stuff. There, there needs to be a system of objective law and to protect us from foreign invasion, have a military and so on. But that's it. It's to protect individual rights, or, or to put it simpler, it's to protect freedom from coercion. It's to protect my ability to live my life as I see fit free from my neighbor coercing me, and certainly free from the government coercing me. Are you more optimistic about American politics? Are you less? I go back and forth. <laughs> I'm overall pessimistic as hell, but I see opportunities here in my home state of Colorado where I see we have a path towards bringing liberty to Colorado. So, so, I, so I'm generally pessimistic, and you have to be because you look at the facts. The facts are not good. And particularly if you look at education. I mean, I think everything starts and ends with our schools and our universities, which are overwhelmingly leftist. However, I agree with you, I, you know, and, and otherwise, how could I do what I do? I mean, I, 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 I work Neither one of us would get long, up very long days yeah. to fight this fight. If I thought it was certain that we lose, I wouldn't do it. I, I think it's likely that we lose, but I think there's a good chance we won. And, and Colorado is a good example. I've been coming to Colorado for over 10 years as part of the leadership program of the Rockies. And uh, giving other talks at you know, Steamboat and at the universities and stuff. And, they, you know, can I, can I see a difference I've made? I think so, in small ways. Um, but Colorado's moved and over believe, that period. And I think, I I think there Colorado, are other people. I believe Colorado is a libertarian, yes. small L, libertarian state. We want people to, we, we're not social uh, uh, prudes, you do no. what you want to do. You want to smoke pot, go smoke pot. I think, but we want government out of our lives. The problem is, you, I think we for haven't the most done it. part that's true. I mean, it, it, unfortunately, most. I mean, that's a that's a it's a it's an optimistic way of viewing people. But right. when you actually push people, they still want their Medicare, they still want their Social Security, and they, also they want still to push want their values on other people. Right. They still want we'll to push their values. A couple so, minutes here. Yep. Gossip here. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Let me ask you about the movies. <laughs> sure. Now. 
when Ayn Rand died, she was working on a miniseries yes. for we have, that, we have that script. Really? Yeah. How did the rights for the movies that have been made, the, the trio of the movies, uh, was was that given by... So uh, Ayn Rand is, it, it left it to Lena Peikoff, who basically inherited everything, and Lena Peikoff, and she told him at the time, she said, sell them make money, don't worry, you can't, you won't get script approval, nobody will give it to you anyway, right? I barely got it for the Fountainhead, you're not right. gonna get it. Uh, so in 1994, he was approached by a businessman, John Eglie Loro, to, uh, and you know, he wrote a check, John Eglie Loro yeah. got option on the movies. The option was renewed a couple of times and then it was just about to expire and Leonard was gonna get the rights back and by this point, there was a lot of interest in making this movie and there was a lot of money and it could be right. made. And Anglillo, two weeks before the option was going to expire, you know, ran it into production, crammed it through, and the result is an awful movie and three <laughs> awful movies that, that I, 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 I didn't, uh, I didn't, I didn't want to fight. Have to, I didn't no, want to no, have to say this because no, they were terrible it's true. movies. It's true. <laughs> it's not right, an issue no, of opinion. No, I didn't want to it's break an your issue heart of fact. Right. And and the movies are awful. Hopefully, at some point, somebody will be able to buy the rights yeah. back and make a because, proper rendition of Alice Shrug. I think she deserves better, well, much I, better. And I b believe the story could be made in a way that that visually would would work, and, and as a film Absolutely. would work. Um, it's I, possible. I just, I just can't imagine Hollywood ever doing it. Well, but it could be. It could be. Today, you do a lot of independent movies. There's, there are people in Hollywood that could do a good job with it. Real fast, people want to learn more. Where do they go? Einrand.org. A Y N R A N D. dot org. You can also follow me on Twitter. You're Ron Brook. Uh, follow me on You're Facebook. On. We're everywhere. I'm Just search. Just I'm do a search. I'm so excited to do this. this I've wanted cool. to do this for years. Thank you. Thank you. Tell a friend, and we'll see you next week.